When you think of director Steven Spielberg's body of work, what's the first film or scene that comes to mind? Maybe it's the fear of the beach you developed after seeing Jaws. Perhaps you picture Harrison Ford running from a boulder, or E.T. levitating Elliot and his bike over some LA suburbs. For me and my 90s upbringing, it's dinosaurs. Specifically, this scene at the Tyrannosaur Paddock. Over 28 years after this film was released, this scene, and many others like it, still hold up to today's standards incredibly well. The 1993 Spielberg classic Jurassic Park is one of the greatest blockbusters ever produced and is one of the most influential movies of all time, paving the way for a CGI revolution. New technologies were created to accommodate its massive scale, and with it came a paradigm shift in the way films were made. But most importantly, Spielberg wanted his audience to believe, for the next two hours, that these dinosaurs were real. That somewhere off the coast of Costa Rica, on an island named Isla Nublar, there were previously extinct creatures alive, hunting, grazing, roaming about in herds, breeding. And Steven Spielberg succeeded in ways no other filmmaker before him was able to. This is the story of how Spielberg brought dinosaurs back to life. Welcome to The Director Project, a collection of video essays created by a number of channels curated into a playlist that each month will focus on a new director. Be sure to check out the playlist in the description below to find other awesome videos about different movies or themes from this month's director. This month is all spiels about Spielberg, and I can't wait to sink my teeth into Jurassic Park. So how did Spielberg bring dinosaurs back to life? I'll show you. When I signed on to this project, I knew my focus would revolve around why the Tyrannosaur attack still holds up in the wake of decades worth of computer-generated achievements. My instinct was to blame Hollywood's current over-reliance on CGI instead of the more traditional, practical effects that much of Jurassic Park employs. Of the 14 minutes of on-screen dinosaurs in the film, 10 of those minutes were pure puppetry and animatronics. But that would be disingenuous to the intent of filmmaker Steven Spielberg, who, if he were making the film today, I'm sure would be much more likely to rely on digital than practical effects. The more I researched the film's production, the more I realized how much the quality of this movie's imagery was a happy accident of timing. When Spielberg set the pre-production in motion, he had no intention of using CG effects for his dinosaurs whatsoever. The technology to create photorealistic animals just wasn't there yet. You'd be surprised to discover Spielberg was originally on board to use a lot of a stop-motion technique called Go Motion in Jurassic Park to create certain scenes. The best that traditional stop-motion had to offer was accomplished in Jason and the Argonauts. The only problem was that every frame of stop-motion in that film was in focus. So when a sword came down, they didn't build in a motion blur. That's where Phil Tippett's new technology, Go Motion, came into play. But Phil Tippett had perfected the motion blur, which gave Go Motion a closer resemblance to real life. Spielberg enlisted Tippett to create a series of animatics, or visual storyboards, for certain action-heavy scenes ahead of filming, specifically the T-Rex attack and the Velociraptor scene in the kitchen. Before we explain how Phil Tippett's line of Go Motion work went extinct, it's important we define Spielberg's intentions going into the film. He was very conscious of the on-film dinosaur portrayals that had come before, much of which used stop motion and rubber suits. The Lost World, Gorgo, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, to name a few, but he favored Godzilla and the T-Rex from 1933's King Kong. My one precedent for Jurassic Park was King Kong. And King Kong was the high watermark of special effects, especially the great fight between King Kong and the Tyrannosaurus Rex. I was so inspired by King Kong, that was one of the reasons I think I wanted to make Jurassic Park. Spielberg was not in the business of trying to make a better dinosaur movie than anyone before him. but. He wanted Jurassic Park to be the most realistic dinosaur movie of them all. And this strive for verisimilitude encompassed the entirety of his project, and from pre to post-production, everyone knew this was going to be a monumental task. Alan Grant, the protagonist of Jurassic Park, was inspired by the real-life paleontologist Jack Horner, who was brought on as a consultant to make sure that each of the teams involved in special effects were creating the closest thing to real dinosaurs. He was adamant that dinosaurs act like modern-day birds, and not reptiles. In one of Tippett's early animatics, Horner criticized the use of a reptilian tongue flicking out of the mouth of a velociraptor, as this was anything but a trait dinos would be capable of doing. So that idea was scrapped from the final film. That said, these days Jack Horner's attempting to recreate living dinosaurs out of chickens. No joke, this man clearly learned nothing from this movie. 
Undoubtedly, one of the most impressive production feats in Jurassic Park are the animatronic dinosaurs created by Stan Winston and his team. Steven Spielberg was inspired to go with animatronics after seeing the 39-foot animatronic Kong at Universal Orlando's Confrontation. Spielberg was well aware of the complications that could arise while dealing with animatronics after working on Jaws. That film likely taught Spielberg a valuable lesson that would carry over into Jurassic Park. Use your monsters sparingly to help build tension. That said, he was convinced the technology had advanced enough that he could get most of the shots he needed with full-sized mechanical dinosaurs, and he hired San Winston's team to handle the creation of a number of animatronics and puppets. This included a Dilophosaur, colloquially known as Spitter, the neck of a Brachiosaur, several puppet suits for the Velociraptors, a baby Velociraptor, a sick Triceratops, and of course, the star of the film, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Phil Tippett's stop motion would pick up the slack wherever Stan Winston's animatronics met their limitations. Spielberg asked a lot from his animators. He needed the audience to be incapable of noticing when the scenes changed from animatronic dinosaurs to stop motion ones. The problem was, Spielberg clearly wasn't satisfied with the stop motion work being done by Tippett. Despite it looking like top-notch stop motion, certain jerks were still very visible. The movement was very accurate and very rhythmical, but there was still something a bit go-motion-y about it. This was about the time that Dennis Muren of Industrial Light and Magic approached Spielberg and offered to do most of the full-size dinosaurs on the computer. And my first reaction was, well, prove it. ILM was the leading CG effects house in the early 90s. They had already created realistic water graphics for James Cameron's The Abyss and were well on their way to realizing the indomitable T-1000 for Cameron's next film when they first reached out to Spielberg's camp. But water and liquid metal are far easier to reproduce than a fully skin-masked animal, which is what they claimed could be done. They began by creating fully animated skeletons of the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Gallimimus, and eventually showed Spielberg a test where they had a herd of Gallimimus skeletons stampeding. I've never seen movements this smooth outside of looking at National Geographic documentaries. But it wasn't until Spielberg saw a fully skinned dinosaur that he realized he would replace Phil Tippett's team of go-motion animators for ILM's computers. What these animators of ILM were capable of doing with CGI for these tests was nothing short of a quantum leap for the medium. Nothing before it had ever come close to looking this good. Spielberg would task ILM with creating 52 unique CGI shots for Jurassic Park. Spielberg chose to keep Phil Tippett's team on, though, not wanting to leave them out of a job. Tippett's decades-long work in the industry was invaluable to ILM, for while they knew how to make cool effects, incorporating them into workable scenes was something ILM needed shepherding on. The biggest hurdle now were the computers themselves. The stop-motion animators couldn't keep up with programs they had no familiarity with. Thus, they created the DID, the Dinosaur Input Device, which allowed the animators to use their traditional stop-motion techniques, which would then be translated into a program. With these two effects teams working together, they split much of the work. ILM did most of the CGI for the film, but Tippett's team would handle the car chase and the kitchen scene. If you look closely at the raptors in the kitchen, you can see vestiges of the typical jerkiness found in stop-motion animation, though it's far more subdued. All of these elements needed ironing out before filming began. The average Hollywood pre-production period lasts about five months. Spielberg said, From the time we officially went into pre-production to the first day of shooting, it was exactly two years and one month to the day. It was such a long process, Spielberg was able to film and complete another movie in the interim. Hook arrived in 1991, but it was clear Spielberg's heart wasn't in Neverland. It was in Isla Nublar. To explain why the dinosaurs work so well, you really have to start by appreciating the incredible talent that is Michael Crichton and the book he published in 1990. Jurassic Park is the thrilling story of how the hubris of man and the dangers of untapped science could lead to catastrophic failure. It's through Crichton's prose, through the characters he creates, and his attention to making the science believable that allow these ideas to come to life. Spielberg knew he couldn't keep every sequence and dinosaur from the book in his film, so he handpicked those he believed would best translate to the screen. He realized the basic story elements, structure, and science from the novel must remain intact for his film adaptation to attain verisimilitude with moviegoers, thus making his film extremely faithful to the source material. The film opens at the Velociraptor enclosure. It's a scene I've never really liked, because I don't believe it's exceptionally realistic. But it serves the purpose of foreshadowing the carnage that later ensues. It's the initial jerk of a roller coaster starting up before it settles on the incline. 
While we only get small glimpses of the actual Stan Winston Raptor puppet, we see the animal's cunning intellect, its speed and fury, and the danger it poses for employees and guests. Then we visit Montana, where we meet paleontologist Alan Grant and the paleobotanist Ellie Sattler working on a Velociraptor dig. The audience is provided a glimpse into what a real dig might look like, as approved by Jack Horner. This serves to develop scientific themes and hypotheses on dinosaurs that will creep their way into how Dr. Grant and Sattler will eventually approach and react to the creatures of Jurassic Park. Their love and respect for these extinct animals would be tested throughout the course of the film, but the sense of wonder for the audience remains constant. One of Spielberg's goals was to showcase the natural instincts of the dinosaurs, benign or deadly, without creating a monster flick. And he succeeded. The first full dinosaur we see in Jurassic Park is the impressive Brachiosaur taking a chomp out of some 50-foot tree. And it's pure movie magic. From the setup, to the disbelief, to the long period before they actually show you the creature, and then John Williams' theme blasts dinosaurs back to life. In the harsh midday sunlight of a Kauai field, we see a fully realized dinosaur for the first time on film. It's a dinosaur. It's a CGI creation that is leaps and bounds beyond anything that has come before. The grandiosity of this one moment and the subsequent reactions of the actors on location effectively extend a promise to the audience that the best is yet to come. You said you've got a T-Rex? Uh-huh. Say again. <laughs> we have a T-Rex. The idea of cloning dinosaurs is ridiculous if you know anything about how DNA decomposes or the limitations we have in the field of genetics, but the basic explanation of how dinosaurs went from bones to flesh in the movie is more than sufficient to suspend our disbelief. Initially, the baby Velociraptor animatronic was supposed to be a puppet, but Spielberg wanted more movement. Because the animatronic was so small, its movements was stunted and spasmodic, which somehow made the performance more convincing. Grant's fearful reaction to the fact that they bred Velociraptors, considering he knows the behavior better than anyone, further foreshadows their inevitable escape. He's more fearful of them than the T-Rex! There are a number of moments specifically designed to keep you believing that this is really happening. Like this moment, when Alan and Ellie make their way over to a sick Triceratops. It's the only dinosaur animatronic they brought to Kauai for filming, but it's important that they did. Seeing Laura Dern's Ellie Sattler cry for this sick creature is one of the strongest moments in the film. Whether she tears up from happiness at seeing a dinosaur up close, whether she's sad for the pitiful state the creature's in, or something else entirely, her emotions bleed onto the screen as Alan feels the huge thrust of breath the animal takes in. It's simultaneously heartwarming and tragic, but it allows Ellie to practice her brand of paleobotany on a living specimen, and the animatronic is, frankly, the most believable of the entire film for me. Perhaps it's the beauty of the location that allows you to picture the animal in its natural habitat. Or maybe it's the simple, beleaguered movements it makes that one can picture a sick animal making. Either way, it's a fantastic moment. Meanwhile, at ILM, the animators found themselves in uncharted waters and took courses in miming to help better understand weight distribution and movement. This helped give their Gallimimus stampede some life. Certain animalistic tendencies given to dinosaurs such as the T-Rex whipping its prey about like a dog with a chew toy provide the audience with some frame of reference as to its behavior. In his novel, Crichton embellished what the Dilophosaurus was capable of, giving it a retractable mane of fins and the ability to spit venom, though this is not corroborated by any fossil record. Winston and Spielberg kept the creature's inaccuracies in the film, probably to help the audiences differentiate it from the many raptors that show up later. They had initially planned to give the spitter more scenes of it walking up to Dennis Nedry, though they never got around to it. This somehow adds some stress to the moment though, as you never see it walk forward, but like a horror film, it keeps somehow getting closer. One of Jurassic Park's best moments is the kitchen scene with the Velociraptors that highlights their predatory nature, their cunning, and their ability to communicate amongst themselves. The majority of the scene is shot from the point of view of the children Lex and Tim, who are crawling down opposite aisles of the raptors. The kitchen sequence, much of which involves impossibly polished stainless steel, provides the juxtaposition of modern convenience alongside the long extinct species, but also a means for the children's escape. The lower point of view also allows for the puppeteers to hide from sight, so all you really see from most angles are the creature's heads, tails, or claws. This is supplemented with some incredible CGI for shots that required the full dinosaurs in frame, which makes it all the more suspenseful. 
The subsequent chase around the building would culminate in what would become the first ever CGI face swap, a precursor to deepfake, if you will. And then, of course, there's my favorite scene. Like that roller coaster being pulled up a slow wooden track, Jurassic Park up to this point follows a slow build to its peak. And like that roller coaster, the film comes to a near standstill as the power in the park shuts down. And then, it's all downhill. Where's the goat? The Tyrannosaurus Rex plops a goat leg on one of the Jeeps, breaks through the fence, and drops the film down one of the greatest roller coaster rides in film history. The scene beautifully mixes practical and digital effects, and it's by far the scene that holds up best in the entire film. Thanks to the likes of Michael Lanteri and the set and effects departments, the world the Tyrannosaur is forced to inhabit comes to life. They built this eerie 24 foot fence to keep the creature out in both Kawaii and Warner Brothers Stage 16, setting the scene as both beautiful and formidable. The T Rex that Winston's team built stood 20 feet tall, 40 feet long, and clocked in at over 13,000 pounds. Originally, they had planned several pre programmed movements for the creature so that it would be easy to do multiple takes, but that didn't pan out. Another had happy accident. By removing the option for smooth motion, it gives the beast an air of unpredictability and indecision. And having a full-sized dinosaur there on set for the cast to react to takes the scene to a whole other level. You feel their terror, you feel its presence, and Spielberg captures it flawlessly. Occasionally, however, they would need to stop filming because the creature's skin, which was made of foam, would get completely soaked and weigh it down too much for it to be functional, giving it the shakes. They would pause to dry it down. The shadows and rainwater do more than make the scene treacherous. They also help mask imperfections in the CGI, providing the scene some incredible longevity. And to top it all off, the actual attack is just so terrifying. No score accompanies this moment as everyone tries to stay quiet. The point of view from within the vehicles is brilliant. And then they drop a literal 13,000 pound T-Rex through the glass ceiling as two children fight it off. The kids briefly steal the scene from her with their visceral screams. I wouldn't be surprised if an entire generation of kids suddenly developed claustrophobia from this moment. Ugh, this captures me every time. It's so good. Also, did you know that for this chase sequence, it reportedly took ILM 12 hours to render each and every frame? Spielberg was so impressed with the T-Rex, claiming it was the star of the film, that he decided to rewrite the end of the film and bring the T-Rex back to finish off the raptors. This aided in his goal of making the dinosaurs more beasts of instinct than beasts of vengeance. The climax is all CGI, and the camera movement really helps hide certain limitations, like this single frame where the Velociraptor simply disappears during the render. All of this is well and good. The animatronics are groundbreaking. The computer-generated imagery is beyond anything that's come before. The acting opposite the dinosaurs brings these creatures to life, but none of it would have worked had it not been for the post-production team over at Skywalker Sound. Spielberg wanted the audience to register the dinosaurs as being believable animals, so they used a mix of animal noises to bring the dinosaurs to life. The T-Rex growls and roars were layered together from elephant, alligator, penguin, tiger, and dog sounds. The raptor calls were made with dolphins, cranes, horses, and geese sounds. The spitter was given swan, hawk, rattlesnake, and howler monkey sounds. You can clearly hear the whale sounds of the brachiosaur mixed with stretched out donkey calls. And because the cast couldn't actually hear the sounds while they were acting, Spielberg was known to provide the actors with the occasional growl to react to. In prep for this video, I was continuously amazed by not only the constant innovations being done for the production of the movie, but also by the sheer amount of talent that Spielberg surrounded himself with for the making of Jurassic Park. If it takes a village to raise a child, what does it take to raise dinosaurs from extinction? Apparently, the best talent in the industry. And that is how Spielberg brought dinosaurs back to life. He accomplished something many would have previously thought impossible. The film would go on to be the highest grossing movie ever, at least until the Titanic sunk five years later. This would be the first and only year Spielberg would ever win the Academy Award for Best Picture. Well, he actually won it for Schindler's List, which blows my mind. How does one person direct the best picture and the highest grossing film ever in the same year? It's an incredible feat. But really, it took more than just Spielberg to make this film a success. The Academy would go on to recognize the work that they had all put in to the visual effects. And the Oscar goes to Dennis Muren, Stan Winston, Bill Tippett, and Michael Lanteri for Jurassic Park. If 1993 is anything to go by, it's clear Spielberg is no one-trick pony. 
Please go and watch some of the other wonderful videos here in the Director Project. If you'd like to contribute a video of your own to the playlist, be sure to tweet your video to Colt Popcher. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new about Jurassic Park and Spielberg. And if you have, we hope we've earned your subscription. If not, I guess we'll have to settle for your like. A huge thanks, as always, goes out to our patrons who make long-form content like this possible. Be sure to click the Director Project playlist for more spiels on Spielberg from other great creators. Have a good one.